Thank you for joining us for the fourth lecture of Sciencia's 2021-22 lecture series. We're delighted you're with us. I'm Anthony Brand, Professor of Composition and Theory at the Shepherd School of Music and Director of Sciencia. Each year, Sciencia brings together outstanding Rice faculty to examine broad themes that transcend disciplines. This year's series celebrates and explores the vast interconnectedness that animates nature and human life. This afternoon, we're excited to welcome architects Maggie Sang and Brittany Udding. Maggie Sang is co-founder of a landscape, architecture, and urban design firm called Department and currently serves as 2021 to 23 Wortham Fellow at Rice University School of Architecture. Her research and practice focus on the relationship between flooding, urbanization, and community resilience. Recent projects include a neighborhood stormwater park in North Miami, which won the Florida Gold Coast APA Award for Innovation. Prior to founding department, Maggie worked in architecture and planning, where she led urban design and planning projects, including zoning updates and neighborhood plans, as well as cultural and institutional building projects. Maggie received her Bachelor of Arts and Master of Architecture from Yale University, she also holds a Master of Design Studies in Urbanism, Landscape, and Ecology from Harvard Graduate School of Design. Brittany Udding is Assistant Professor of Architecture at Rice University and co-founder of the Research and Design Collaborative Home Office. Her work examines the spatial, political, and ecological arrangements of collective life. She previously taught at the University of Michigan as the 2017-2018 Willard A. Oberdick Fellow, Brittany received her Master of Architecture from Yale University and a BS in Architecture from the Georgia Institute of Technology. She practiced at Thomas Pfeiffer and Partners as project designer for the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw. She has also editorial experience at the Log Journal for Architecture and served on the board of Cartha Magazine. Brittany is a registered architect in New York. They'll both speak, then we'll have 10 minutes for question and answers, and we'll invite you then, uh, if you're in person, to our reception in the lobby, warmly welcome you there. Uh, please also mark April 26th at 7 p.m. on your calendars for our annual, annual Bachner Lecture, which this year features Merlin Sheldrake, author of Entangled Life. Please join me in welcoming Maggie and Brittany. Hello, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me in the back? <laughs> okay, um, let me just get settled here for a moment and see what's... Well, as you just mentioned, my name is Maggie Sang. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you to um, Anthony for organizing and to Adriana for coordinating. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the relationship between city and nature through two projects and installations. Um, sorry, I'm coordinating two computers right now, so if it feels awkward, it's because it is awkward. <laughs> so first, I'm going to start with this image of beachfront property along the Gulf Coast. Uh, the desire to control and manage nature is pervasive. In his 1991 book titled Slide Mountain, environmental and legal historian Theodore Steinberg writes, the American penchant for owning nature shows in one specific and enormously important way how absurd and contradictory life in the modern world has become. There is no denying the whimsy and confusion of a culture that has tried to impose a capitalist logic on the seemingly non-ideological matter in motion that we call nature. And so it's at precisely this confusing intersection of capitalist logic and matter in motion that I want to situate this lecture. The history of urban development and urban expansion, particularly in the United States, has been driven primarily by the desire to control and manipulate the natural environment for human purposes. Architects, engineers, developers, and planners have all been complicit in this legacy of urbanization. 
um, from land reclamation in the Boston Harbor. Here, a map showing the gray, the gray line showing the old city shoreline. To the draining of the Everglades in South Florida to make way for the development of Miami. To the channelization and manipulation of the meandering bayous here in Houston. All of these efforts have had a lasting impact on today's urban landscape and environment. Not only have we created a novel ur urban ecosystem filled with hot concrete and invasive species, but we've also inherited a number of environmental risks from stormwater flooding to sea level rise to water quality issues. And as a designer facing this context, it's a responsibility to not only address these critical issues in the built environment through infrastructure and sustainable design, but I would argue more importantly, it's a responsibility to model alternative cultural attitudes and norms that fundamentally transform the way that we think and interact with our environment. How can we look at the built environment through the lens of man through the lens of management, repair and maintenance and care, not control and domination? How do we think about adaptive infra infrastructure that is not only hard engineered as a solution, but dependent on so the soft infrastructure of social and ecological systems? These are the questions that my design practice and I ask as a researcher. Which brings me to the title of this lecture. Uh, the reason why this lecture is called Attractive Nuisance or Attractive Nuisances actually stems from an interaction that I had with a lawyer about uh, this first project and installation that I'm going to discuss today. Um, the project is called Pine in the Sand and is a living installation located at the Wallach Garden at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, when I presented this project to the lawyer, um, she bluntly called it an attractive nuisance. Um, she said out of concern for the institution's liability, she insisted that we, were, we would use signage to warn visitors about the risks involved with the installation and to ward people from interacting with it and from getting close to it, which we did. But beyond the lawyer's concern about signage, the concept of an attractive nuisance has really stuck with me. Taken out of the context from its strict legal definition, and I acknowledge that there is a strict legal definition, but here I'm really viewing it as a provocation about how we engage and interact with the environment. How do we socially and culturally construct what we perceive to be either attractive and or a nuisance? And how, what do we consider the norm in our environments and landscapes? In fact, the goal of the entire installation itself was to explore how people would interact with and shape a landscape over time. Like the title, the physical contents of the installation are quite simple. A pitch pine tree is planted um, in a 12 foot mound of sand. Concrete Jersey barriers um, are used to partially contain that mound in a U-shaped wall. And there are granite benches opposite the mound for visitors to sit and rest. Though simple on the outside, the installation depends on what cannot be easily seen. From the specially calibrated soil mixes that balance nutrient content and structural stability, to the locally sourced pitch pine that was extracted from the ground through a process called air spading to preserve the majority of its roots, to our less than scientific modeling of wind effects and erosion. Rain, wind, and snow altered the appearance of the tree and the mound. Winter turns it into a small snow cap. And the color of the sand changes depending on if it's, if it's rained recently. Even small mammals and pioneer plants moved in. Beyond the physical components of the installation, visitors were invited to engage in a variety of actions, relationships, and etiquettes that brought the pile to life. Following these deliberately vague instructions to please take care, and given a couple of brooms and rakes, a social world of the sand pile began to take shape. From gentle raking and upkeep, to running and playing and climbing, precisely what the lawyer was afraid of, uh, to writing fleeting messages, and finally to quiet reflection. 
the deliberately mundane elements of the installation, tree, sand, pile, a tree, sand pile, concrete jersey, jersey barriers, come together to create a space that is transformed by the social and cultural dimensions of maintenance, care, and upkeep. The installation becomes a barometer for change, registering short-term changes in the weather as well as slower changes in the seasons, and reflecting back the attitudes and behaviors of those who either take, choose to take care of it or to deface it. As an attractive nuisance, pine in the sand highlights the cautious and almost litigious way that we view our surroundings and our responsibility and etiquettes towards them. Through the life cycle of the project, the pile was in fact revealed to be more than an image, but rather a monument to impermanence and a small hill that manifested the way in which we contribute to the degradation and the care of our environments. Um, the second project is a community park in North Miami. Uh, North Miami is a city that, like much of South Florida, experiences um, regular and pervasive flooding, as well as the risks of sea level rise. Um, so the purpose of this particular park, called the Good Neighbor Stormwater Park, um, that we designed was, was to primarily to help local flooding um, and to help reduce local flooding within the neighborhood. Uh, the site for the park was an empty lot in a low density neighborhood. Of course, there used to be a house on this lot, but it flooded so frequently that eventually the city uh, offered to buy the owner out. When the owner accepted the offer, the city condemned the house, demolished it, and just left the lot vacant, um, regularly mowing the, lawn, mowing the lawn just for maintenance purposes for almost two decades. Um, here's a satellite image of the greater Miami region where you can see the location of the site. But in fact, this site was not a standalone, um, but there are actually hundreds of properties within this region that experience repeat flooding, a phenomenon that FEMA calls repetitive loss properties, or RLPs. Um, but RLPs in North Miami are not happenstance. Um, in this map comparison with a 19th century survey of the same area, the same exact frame, you can see that these properties and the, prop the site in particular marked with a white um, X or white cross almost precisely falls within a former waterway called the Arch Creek Basin. Though the lot appears to be far inland, several miles inland actually, a sample excavation revealed that the water table was just inches below grade. So in this context, the primary goal of the park was to store and capture as much stormwater as possible and to reduce local flooding. The way we did that was to transform the flat lot into a retention basin, creating more space for water storage. But another equally, if not more important goal was to communicate the environmental history of the site, and in doing so to inform neighbors about the inherent flood risk in the area. Digging a hole on the site and creating the central retention basin um, not only created more room for storage, but it was actually unearthing a hidden creek. So the park itself functions as a visual marker of the former Arch Creek, exposing the groundwater such that changes in the water levels are visible to the public. Unlike typical forms of stormwater infrastructure, which are either buried or hidden from sight, this park showcases um, and renders legible the flows of stormwater and the hydrological dynamics of the entire neighborhood. In the dry seasons or on dry days, the water level is relatively low, while on uh, while well, during the wet season or immediately after storms, the water level is extremely high. An oversized blue stormwater pipe conveys the stormwater from the perimeter of the park into the central basin, but also serves as a play object in a seating surface. In the basin itself, there are elevation markers that demarcate the fluctuating water levels. On some days, the markers are visible, and on others, they are submerged. And the plant communities that wrap the perimeter of the park and the new walking path are also designed to register the gradient of flooded conditions on the site. Um, from the high point of the site here, um, on this right side, <laughs> um, where there's a pine flatwood descending in elevation all the way to um, the slough, which accommodates the most, um, the most flooded conditions. Interpretive signage about these plant communities, neighborhood flood hazards, and the history of the site provide context and information about the park and function and the, its function in the neighborhood. 
So initially in the design phases, the stormwater park received similar, a similar reaction as pine in the sand. Labeled an attractive nuisance, the city officials were concerned that it exposed too much water, um, that the water would be a habitat to undesirable bugs, that the playful blue pipe would encourage kids to play too much. Um, people were uncomfortable with this new format for public space, a neighborhood park that not only provided an open space and walking paths and gardens, but actually functioned as a form of flood infrastructure. Um, that communities were so accustomed to the invisibility of infrastructure that they only notice it when it doesn't function, when the streets are flooded or when drains are overflowing. Oops, sorry. Um, but the Good Neighbor Stormwater Park ultimately offers an alternative model for infrastructure, one that provides multiple benefits in a very small footprint, um, reducing local flooding, establishing new habitats and strengthening ecosystems and providing a space where people can engage the environment and their surrounding dynamic landscape. So from open stormwater systems to actively eroding sand piles, my hope is that I've shared with you a pro the provocation of an attractive nuisance. Again, taken out of the context of its strict legal definition, the concept challenges our conventional ways of relating to and interacting with our urban landscapes and also works against the dominant culture of control and management of nature and instead invites alternative ways of designing with and for nature. So with that, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, thanks, Maggie, for that really amazing talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, so before I begin, I wanted to thank uh, the SANSI Lectures Committee and Director Anthony Brandt for my, inviting me to share my work here today with you. And I'd also really like to thank um, Adriana for organizing the talk and all of her amazing help. I appreciate it. Um, so today I'm going to be sharing two design projects, uh, Model Homes, which is an exhibition I completed as a, as a design fellow at the University of Michigan in 2018, and Palm House, uh, which is an exhibition at the Citigroup Collective Gallery in New York that just recently closed. Um, so uh, as uh, Anthony introduced, uh, uh, I have a small research and design collaborative called Home Office um, that I co-founded uh, with Daniel Jacobs in 2017. Um, so our research and design work explores the conditions of architectural production uh, paying attention as much to the protocols and policies that shape the built environment as to the details of an enclosure. So from the home to the garden, the two projects that I will be sharing with you today uh, seek to rethink our living spaces, not as neutral backdrops, but as living and lively spaces um, that offer new connections between the technical systems and material ecologies that we inhabit. So this first project, Model Homes, proposes an alternative developer catalog for the suburb imagining new typologies of domestic space that re-script the familiar forms of the home. So as a series of models, drawings, financial analyses, and slogans, the catalog of homes is perhaps the most prolific author of the American suburban landscape. It typically describes each model through a stylistic narrative coupled with a standardized floor plan. Each model's name is meant to appeal to a consumer archetype with an architectural style, such as Sears homes like the Cape Cod number 13354A-13354B, -13354B, the Chateau number 3378, and the Milford number 3385. The name's tone is nostalgic, but at odds with the numerical designation of each model. The pragmatism of the list reveals the underlying apparatus at work, a catalog that co-ops the narratives of the home to camouflage its underlying mechanisms of financial risk, debt, and behavioral management. So embracing the combinatorial reverence of the catalog, this project uh, explores how the abstraction of the home can appropriate developers' tactics in order to rescript our forms of everyday life. As shown here in Ernst Neufert's org chart of domestic space hierarchies, the plan governs as an infrastructure that reproduces specific subjectivities, family structures, and daily rituals, from the one-room dwelling in the, in the center to the multi-roomed mansion um, uh, in the branching diagram. So by reducing the home to a series of rooms, materials, and inventories, indifferent to the familial logics of social production, this project asks if we can instead produce a new species of domestic space. So conceptualized as an alternative developer catalog for the suburb, the exhibition and, and um, accompany text presented 138 new domestic models. Each type simplifies the diagram of the home into the most intimate conditions of daily life, eating, sleeping, bathing, working, and relaxing. 
This reduction of the home into a series of generic rooms creates housing typologies that can accommodate new modes of cohabitation. Disassociating program from the logic of type generates a radically different set of spatial relationships, producing alternative social forms and kinship structures. For instance, how can the simple elimination of the hallway undermine the maintenance of privacy? How does the removal of the private kitchen from the home open up spaces for collective use and negotiation? How do the multiplication and redundancies of spaces for leisure or labor create new patterns of occupancy and use within the home? Or how can the sharing of boundaries challenge conditions of property, access, stewardship, and consensus? And if we minimize domestic infrastructures, can people begin to leverage the costs of ownership to decrease the financial risks and increase the financial opportunities of the home? So by simplifying the organizational diagram of each model into the most basic conditions of daily life, this project proposes that there is the possibility of reprogramming the home to produce new forms of habitation. Number one, the house with only a bed. Number six, the house for two friendly roommates. Number eight, the house for two roommates divided by two corridors. Number 10, the house where four friendly people can live and work together. Number 11, another house where four friendly people can live and work together. Number 16, the house for four pairs divided by four corridors. Number 22, the home office. Number 23, the house without kinship structures. Number 32, the house for four people that bathe apart but work together. House number 33, the house for four people that work apart but bathe together. House number 39, the house where two people can live apart from the other four. Number 40, the house where sleeping is a communal act. Number 45, the house without hierarchies. Number 47, the house for a person to sleep, bathe, cook, and play. Number 54, the house for four people who sleep alone but live together. Number 85, the house for two people that cook together. Number 107, the house that's 50% bedrooms. Number 109, the house for work and play. Number 113, the house for three people with two yards. Number 117, the house for people only order out. Number 131, the house for an average size household. Number 137, the house that's really a duplex. And number 138, the house that's a series of rooms. So by laying bare the mechanisms of the home and its plans, these generic rooms offer a space in which to reinscribe re the conventions of domesticity. The gallery exhibition likewise appropriates similar techniques of abstraction through a heightened hyperreal. Enticingly glossy, reflective, and underlit in order to make visible their status as, as commodities, the vitrines recreate the aura of the model showroom, creating an ideal atmosphere for consumption and display. So this project asks that if the model home is an architectural proxy, a stand-in for new form of life, the vitrines and their suspended typological forms function as this intermediary, deploying the tactics of commodity display to propose alternative models of cohabitation. So within the gallery space, the 138 model homes produce an ideal backdrop for the vitrines, appropriating the techno aesthetics of data display, combinatorics, and org chart logistics. The vitrines and matrix of types reduce the home to its barest spatial grammars. So while these digital impulses towards seriality lists and data analysis seemingly reproduce the pathologies of suburban development, the idea is that the combinatorial possibilities of domestic space instead create a catalog devoid of ready-made content, image, and identity. So the effects of this domestic reprogramming can potentially extend beyond the interior of the home into the space of the city. When these types are deployed as a neighborhood, the municipal, transactional, and civic protocols of the suburb shift disrupting typical formats of ownership through the consolidation of lots and the commoning of property. Instrumentalizing the home to remap a territory's physical resources and legal formats, the project asks what are the urban possibilities of these combinatorics. So as expressed in Dan Graham's Homes for America project uh, from 1966, the catalogs, combinatorics of architectural style and model, uh, and model number leverage the iconography of the home to clad otherwise standard floor plans. Graham begins by listing the available styles and colors in a set of developer tract houses in Cape Coral, Florida. A, the Sonata, B, the Concerto, C, the Overture, or D, the Ballet, and a choice of colors such as white, moonstone gray, nickel, and seafoam green. Graham then systematically calculates all possible combinations of houses. Quote, a block of eight houses utilizing four models and four colors might have 48 times 48 or 2,304 possible arrangements. The doggedness of his method and the exhaustion of his catalog reconstructs the useless machine of development, heightening the contradictions and extremes of the suburban enclave. So if the suburb continues to constitute a space of desire, of, of homemaking, of life building, what new freedoms of urban form and domestic deployment are possible within these combinatorial games? So playing the same game, Dan Graham's game of deadpan combinatorics to produce new suburban forms, 
the project deployed a simple random number generator to create a series of 10 by 10 matrices that laid out new neighborhoods, each with 100 homes. After procedurally placing each model in a specified lot, the resulting layout created an unfamiliar suburban landscape, one that resisted the homogeneity expected from these combinatorial games. The resulting ethos generated by the juxtaposition of each housing type created new confrontations, new courtyards, clearings, obstructions, but also more routes and itineraries. So the permutations constituted a new catalog of domestic models full of minimalisms and excesses, unusual layouts, programmatic duplications, and spatial redundancies. So rescripting the suburb's traditional roles and instrument of ideology and governance, 138 model homes instead leverages the open frame of a series of rooms to inscribe more varied forms of private and public life. Characterized by typological variation and topological diversity, these unfamiliar rearrangements of rooms produce housing types that question predetermined and standardized kinship structures so typically offered in the suburban um, in the suburban catalog. So the second project, Palm House, um, we move away from the suburb and into um, the garden. It examines an intimate encounter between a plant, the people who tend it, and the architecture that houses it. So the project begins at the Ordo Botanico in Italy, a garden founded by the University of Padua in 1545 for medicinal plant research. The herbarium, which you can see in the upper right quadrant of this plan, takes the form of a circle divided into quadrants, each containing a carefully curated arrangements of specimens um, that reproduce the classification systems and taxonomic, uh, taxonomic, taxonomic structures of botanical medicine at the time. The herbs and plants in the garden imported from all over the world were used to train medical students to identify spe species for medical and therapeutic remedies. A difficult practice back in the 1500s in which mistakes could lead to incorrect dosages or ingredients. The specimens in the garden also serve as the plant stock for the Venetian Republican Republic's uh, pharmaceutical trade. Because of the rarity and the value of its specimens, the gar garden was fortified against theft with a thick circular stone wall, which you can see here in the drawing. Along this garden wall survives the oldest of the garden specimens, a 450 year old Mediterranean palm a species of palm tree indigenous to Southern Europe with a variety of medicinal uses. You can see it here in the yellow call out. Um, so this particular specimen became known more famously as Goethe's palm, serving as a critical subject for Goethe's theory on botanical morphology enumerated in his 1790 essay, The Metamorphosis of Plants. In this text, Goethe outlines a theory describing the relationship between a plant's environmental conditions and its patterns of growth and development. Beyond the formal mechanics of Linnaean classification, Gota argued that the plant's internal morphology was in constant tension with and informed by the plant's climatic conditions, from atmospheric composition to soil nutrients to the availability of water. So to protect the, the scientifically and culturally valuable specimen over the centuries, university gardens, gardeners constructed a series of temporary and permanent palm houses to both shelter and display the palm. And you can see in these two etchings, one is the summertime when there's no greenhouse, and in, in the right is the wintertime when there's a greenhouse attached to the wall. Um, early etchings reveal elaborate structures that were built around the palm each winter and then removed in late spring. The earliest photographic evidence of the palm house structure is an ornate wood and glass shelter designed and built in the 1870s, which was later replaced by an operable concrete steel and glass greenhouse in the 1930s after a cold, a cold, cold wave in 1929 almost killed the palm. The current structure um, in this sort of hilarious picture uh, was a renovation in the early 2000s that transformed the palm house into an operable enclosure featuring radiant heating as well as large panes of plate glass that open and close depending on the internal temperature. Each stage of these palm house architectures reveals the changing relationship between a living ecosystem and the technical, environmental, and material conditions required for its care. So while early greenhouses were often temporary and open air structures built to protect non-native species vulnerable to extremes in temperature and weather, Industrial forms of horticultural production began to radically transform greenhouse architectures and its attendant technologies. So the transformation of these seasonal shelters into large scale infrastructures emerged from the reciprocal development of iron, glass and capitalism, mobilized by an emerging network of global extraction. As colonial empires accrued wealth and territorial holdings in the 18th and 19th centuries, they built botanical spaces to house specimens collected in colonized lands, carefully transported in Wardian case, case terrariums on their long journey overseas. And you can see a picture uh, drawing on the right of the Wardian case. These collections emerged alongside new architectural forms and environmental systems for cultivation and display. 
For example, the development of material technology such as cast iron and glass enable the construction of light filled structures with spans large enough to contain entire ecosystems. Also, steam heating allowed the, for the year long maintenance of humidity and temperature conditions required for tropical plants. These architectures, as exemplified in the Palm House and London's Kew Gardens, uh, brought the botanical spoils of empire to the public eye. And today, the contemporary greenhouse landscape has taken the form of immense distribution centers. As demand for horticultural products grows, a logistical landscape of industrial greenhouses has emerged, further mobilizing extensive infrastructures of land technology and capital. For instance, agricultural and horticultural industries in the Westland region of the Netherlands have created a vast system of greenhouse interiors amounting to almost 40 square miles. <clears throat> this current generation of greenhouses utilizes drones, sensors, and hydroponic systems to optimize and automate the interior climate. Pink grow lights produce a perpetual state of photosynthesis, creating hectares of eerily illuminated interior ecosystems. So these historical palm houses and contemporary plant distribution centers prompt us to ask in this project, <clears throat> how can architectural systems of the greenhouse complicate the traditional role of nature as an object of consumption and contemplation? Can we instead make visible the infrastructures of care, energy, and exchange required for the growth of each specimen? Like Gota's morphological theories, the technical forms of horticultural architecture could instead relate more critically to its ecological conditions. Continuing the four centuries of cultivation that began in 1585 with the planting of Gota's palm and taking cues from contemporary greenhouse technologies, Palm House proposes three future prototypes that house this specimen. Palm House number one is a circular structure that suspends a series of fabric air ducts around the palm, surrounding it completely. Each duct is connected by hose to an air and vapor compressor controlled by an air schedule. <clears throat> Each duct is connected um, by adjusting the air schedule, botanical technicians are able to create new atmospheric compositions, expelling clouds of gas and vapor to envelop the palm when external conditions stray from the ideal. Calibrating the palm's immediate atmosphere to counter dangerous particulate clouds, molecular swarms, and synthetic ozones, care workers can curate a more chemically compatible environment for the palm. The architecture also allows the palm to retreat from its touristic gaze, visible only when the ducts are deflated and the atmosphere is safe. The structure breathes, inhaling, inflating, exhaling, even sighing, becoming an extension of the plant's living and sensing ecology. Palm house number two similarly responds to the increasing concentration of environmental pollutants that threaten to overwhelm the palm's natural osmotic defense systems. Composed of an infrastructure of filtration panels, the wall assemblies can open and close with a motorized gear system, limiting the infiltration or increasing the ventilation of airborne particulates. By adjusting these assemblages, botanical technicians can curate atmospheric compositions, filter dangerous pollutants, and shield the palm from extreme radiation. The shingled and breathable envelope is maintained by workers who carefully monitor current atmospheric systems, replace vent filter units in the structure, or operate the facade to open and close in order to influence pollination and particulate counts. When fully open, the palm is clearly visible and when closed, it becomes abstracted through the mesh filters, once again deferring the possibility of unmediated viewing. Palm house number three <clears throat> allows botanical technicians to calibrate the palm's balance of heat and light, protecting it from extreme temperature and lighting conditions as the climate radically shifts. The structure is designed as an open armature that uses solar greenhouse curtains to regulate the palm's exposure to light while also providing a thermal barrier. The secondary structure <clears throat> of movable wall modules installed with panels of grow lights and heat lamps can be repositioned to provide the palm with extra heat and light as needed. By calibrating heat gain and solar exposure, care workers can adjust and design the spectral output for the palm, protecting the plant from extreme temperature fluctuations while also preventing the harmful absorption of excess solar radiation. In the eerie glow of the lights, the shimmering veil of the solar blanket and the caution stickers that line the access ladder, an aesthetic of ecological extremes creates a new lens through which to behold the palm foregrounding the specimen's increasing need for mediation. So the Palm House project also took the form of an exhibition at the Citigroup Gallery in New York, a narrow subterranean space and two bridges in lower Manhattan. The, the low linear space was filled with three light boxes that suspended images of each Palm House for viewing. From the street, a passerby could glimpse the glowing images hovering in the center of the space. <clears throat> Upon entry, the small scale of the room created a necessary confrontation between the viewer and the images of the Palm. The saturated presence of the images worked in contrast to an array of technical drawings and supporting evidence that lined the wall. The 50 tablets contain orthographic, axonometric, and details 
that describe the tectonic, the tectonic assemblies, material inventories, timesheets, specifications, and techniques of care that went into the production of both the Palm House designs and the ex exhibition itself. The representation of these techniques of production and care was also critical to the project's research agenda. Alongside the drawings displayed in the exhibition were texts that documented the role of the Palm's caretaker, including how often workers clean and prune the leaves, their watering schedules, and when to add nutrients and chemicals to the soil. Email dialogues discussing the histories of the Palm House and the maintenance protocols of the Palms with the head librarians, curators, and gardeners at the Ordo Botanico were represented along these technical drawings on the wall. <clears throat> the exhibition also included a material acknowledgement which described the origins, mining, and refining locations, trade legislations, and the regional environmental impact of the materials used to construct the project. Documents examined the supply chains of materials typically used in greenhouses like glass or acrylic panels and aluminum extrusions, following the tra trail from extraction to production to distribution. So reflecting the material inventory of the prototypes, the light boxes were composed of, a, um, of extruded aluminum angles, fluorescent utility lights, screws, extension cords, zip ties, and acrylic sheets. By duplicating the details of the palm houses, the light boxes recreated the material assemblies and tecton tectonic details of the palm houses themselves within the space of the gallery. <clears throat> Positioned in the gallery, the images were juxtaposed against a background of technical drawings and documents staging the architectural object alongside the bureaucratic processes of production, sourcing, and specifying. Moving beyond the purely visual encounter, such a strategy called for, calls for a renewed awareness of both the environmental and material lineages of our architectures. So by way of a conclusion, um, I wanted to end with a, a quote by Jane Hutton um, from her recent book, Reciprocal Landscapes. When she writes, quote, the textures, smells, and structures of particular materials give people tactile and intimate contact with fragments of distant landscapes in their myriad social and ecological relations, end quote. So through this lens, my work, uh, our work is interested in an in architecture that engages more intimately and deeply, not just with the land and its specimens, but also with the sensuous qualities of its, envir of its environmental and technical systems. These two projects, model homes and palm houses, make a claim for how we might reformat our living spaces to deploy our habits of care towards the maintenance of both human and more than human worlds. Thank you. Maggie and Brittany, thank you for the wonderful talks. Uh, now we'll open the floor for questions. Would anybody like to start with a question? Let me lead off with one. Um, one thing that strikes me in both of your talks is um, an aspect of almost political statements in the architecture, which, you know, for those of us outside the field, we often don't look at buildings that way. How does, how does that influence your thinking and how do you relate to clients when they have a particular project if there's also a political message that's going to be trans, transmitted, if you know what I mean? Um, so I, that's, a, that's a great question. And I think, um, I think it's important to, to always sort of, I mean, in research practices, to always foreground how architecture does participate in a, in a political ecology. It mobilizes vast resources of material, of labor, of capital, of land. And to, to pretend that architecture is neutral, that it's apolitical, um, kind of really undermines a lot of the agency that space has in, in kind of shaping our political and social relationships. So I think it's, it's critical to always understand that these, these architectures are not backdrops, right? They are um, deeply implicated and embedded in, um, in, in a political landscape. And I also think it's important, I mean, Maggie and I have maybe different practice types, um, but I, I think it's also important to understand that the kind of production of architecture doesn't exclusively serve clients or a client that through which there's only kind of a, an exchange of, of money it's not purely a transactional kind of enterprise. I think it's important to look at architecture as a way of world making, right? As a space of speculation that um, can exist beyond um, a kind of client, a client or patron relationship. And so I think that's what's interesting or is finding ways of, of thinking through architectural production that um, maybe sort of separate, maybe in which we are not given a brief, but we make our own brief and it becomes a kind of a space of, of research and production in that way. Yeah, I think I'd, no, okay. 
<laughs> and Brittany didn't have to stand, now I have to stand and talk about it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. I think that it's also um, highlights the unique position of being in a professional field that's also engaged in academia. And I think, um, I guess in, in the two projects that I presented, maybe the latter one more than the, pre, the first one, um, you know, it was thinking about the possibility of design in terms of communicating things that are maybe not necessarily visible to an average, you know, person who might not be thinking about the history of landscape or the history of urbanization or the legacies of urbanization, but really to kind of connect with people on a very kind of basic level to say, like, uh, talk about how the way that we do things today in terms of engineering, making our city, for, um, thinking about resilience are all up for grabs and that there are ways of rethinking these um, rethinking the way that we interact with our built environment and design the built environment and natural environment um, that um, that are just sort of critical um, critical spaces to be working in and I think that with clients it's really challenging to find that space where you do that and it's about and I, for lack of a better way of saying it's about sort of small wins um, and you know, with that North Miami client, um, it was a really challenging project to push forward with the city government itself to say that we're going to put this giant hole, <laughs> it's filled with water, and kids are, might fall into it, and you're going to have to maintain it, and it's totally different from the way that you think about parks on a normal basis where there might just be sort of like dogs running around or playground equipment right and so it was through conversations and relating to the clients and through a series of meetings just, and for just convincing and communicating with them that like just the small reformatting or rethinking of infrastructure is something that is living and something that that the sort of visibility of the water would actually have have a dramatic impact on the neighborhood um to me that was like a a, a small way of communicating a broader political issue about infrastructure and the environment. Yeah. Sorry, no, no, it's all right. Thank you. Um, I've got a question about the model homes project. So, so first of all, for that, thank you for the talks. They're both great. Uh, I've been an engineer here at Rice for the last 10 years and a student for four years long before that. So it's actually the first architecture talk I've ever been to in my time here. So it was new and refreshing Welcome. and interesting. Uh, so a salute to Anderson then. Um, so yeah, so my background and training is computer science. And we are here in the temple of computation here at Rice. And so when I saw the, the Model Homes project, there's there were so many elements there that screamed to me the, the potential for computation, automation, programming. So I'm wondering, could you talk about whether these elements were involved in your creations or were they not and why? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Cause like words like parametricism are really dangerous sometimes in architecture because they have a lot of embedded ideologies, stylistic ideologies um, and, and ways of, of kind of form making. But I do think it's um, interesting to maybe separate the role of the parametric from form and think about it as a process as a almost as a as a way of um, kind of untangling the the sort of logics or deep structure of space and how it's organized, um, how it, how its adjacencies produce specific types of relationships. So, um, for the model homes project, uh, I actually sort of I began um, with the org chart um, as this sort of abstract uh, diagram of spatial relationships, and through that constructed a series of of, of these model homes. And so it was done, though, although I sort of used the, the kind of the aesthetics of, of computation of cybernetics of this kind of hardcore data escape, um, they were all done with my brain. Uh, they were all uh, handmade, hand clicked. Uh, and so, uh, but, they, but I was interested in, in using the kind of aesthetics of the diagram of the org chart, the aesthetics of this like super dry um, data space to to kind of make visible the underlying mechanisms of the developer catalog which is a purely kind of quantitative um, a quantitative uh, series of plans that have these kind of qualitative attributes attached to them like the the kind of the iconog iconographic um, home image right 
And so I think that it's important to, in, in that project, it was, it was about um, kind of laying bare these, these processes and, and thinking how the kind of, uh, the aesthetics of data or the aesthetics of computation could be used to kind of, to, to restructure or reorient the, the home landscape. I hope that answers your question. Well, it was done in the computer, but not uh, automatically. <laughs> you were in control. A human was in control. A human was in control, yeah, as they often are. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, another question? Uh, all right, let me ask another one. Um, so, you know, we don't normally think about buildings and planned obsolescence and things like that, but it seems like climate change is putting a pressure on everything and, and the way our environments are changing so quickly. How is that impacting how architects think about something that when you build now, may be in a very different environmental condition in five or 10 years, you know, the way things are going? Well, I'll speak from maybe the perspective of landscape architecture where we're not necessarily constructing buildings, but in, the, in our work really thinking about um, landscape as a form of infrastructure, and it's very much involved in this question of time. And I think currently responses, planning responses, development responses, et cetera, to resilience and how we're facing climate change and sea level rise and growing environmental risk have really either been quite short-sighted or very long future-oriented to the point of not understanding how things will be implemented. And so what I'm really interested in is this kind of um, in between space or medium time or medium scale of intervention where the stormwater park, for example, is not a type of approach that has, um, you know, will live beyond maybe 50 years in North Miami um, because of the sea level rise conditions. And I think that we accept that as a challenge, as something that needs to also be met with a design response that there are still solutions that can be, or still ways of thinking about the landscape that, you know, um, have a specific time frame associated with them. They're designed for a particular time frame. Um, maybe not just the immediate response to a crisis or an emergency, but also not the sort of far off utopia that doesn't have implications for everyday people's like real lives and having to deal with your house flooding, you know, every time there's a high tide or a king tide, right? So I think that this kind of medium scale and thinking about these kind of smaller scale interventions of storm of infrastructure are actually really doable for certain communities like it's the, that project was like $80,000 to construct to design and build and so um, really cheap <laughs> for the scale of a, a of a of a park and I think it's important to be honest about those sorts of budgets so that like when you're actually rolling them out in sort of in in neighborhoods and in cities that like this becomes a really feasible form of medium term stormwater infrastructure for communities that are oriented and focused on neighbor neighbors and not just talking about you know let you have to move from here uh, you shouldn't have lived here to begin with i think that it's important to sort of operate within that messy space of of, of that medium time so hopefully that answers some part of that question I think you answered it very well. <laughs> great. Any more questions? Thank you. Those were great answers. Um, well, please join us for the reception and please uh, join me in thanking Maggie and Brittany again for terrific talks. Thank you. <laughs>